Le Mans 66, or Ford v Ferrari to give the film its United States title, is a James Mangold directed biopic featuring Christian Bale and Matt Damon which tells the true story of endurance racers Ken Miles and Carroll Shelby and their attempts to win the 24 hours of Le Mans with Ford's GC40 against the might of Ferrari and the corporate interference of Ford executives. But whilst the film is based on a true story, it is explicitly not a documentary, so I thought it'd be interesting to go through what the film changed about the real life story for the purposes of getting it to work as a Hollywood movie. There'll obviously be major spoilers throughout the rest of the video for this film, so be warned in case you want to go in blind, which I would strongly recommend. The opening scene of the film shows Shelby driving for Aston Martin in the middle of a rainy night to win Le Mans in 1959. The film correctly refers to Shelby as one of three American winners of Le Mans at that point in time, the others being Phil Hill owned the previous year, as well as Italian-American Luigi Cinetti in 1949. Unlike Shelby though, both of them won driving for Ferrari. During this scene, Shelby is briefly set on fire after fuel is accidentally spilt on him during a pit stop. It's quickly extinguished and Shelby is able to carry on to eventual victory. In real life, this fire didn't happen to Shelby at Le Mans, but it did happen far more dramatically to Shelby's teammate Roy Salvadori in the following round of the World Sports Car Championship, the Tourist Trophy at Goodwood Circuit in Chichester, England, which is likely what inspired this scene in the film. Petrol poured over the car and myself, and in a moment we were ablaze. I leapt straight over the bonnet, kicking mechanic John King on the head as he was changing a front wheel. That was the first he knew of the fire. I found myself on the thin strip of grass dividing the pit road from the track and just rolled over and over trying to put out the flames. Then a St John's ambulance man rushed up and wrapped his coat around me, dousing the fire except for my right hand. He wrapped his cap around that, and I was out. Shelby looks visibly uncomfortable driving and in the scene afterwards he's told by a doctor that there's a busted valve in his heart which forces him to stop racing in order to prevent a fatal heart attack. In reality, Shelby knew about his heart problems before Le Mans but had neglected to tell anyone about it and was driving with a nitroglycerin capsule under his tongue in case his condition flared up whilst driving. One thing that the film doesn't mention is that on top of his heart problems, Shelby was suffering another issue causing him major discomfort. Physically, it was very tough as I had dysentery during the entire race in 1959. Something I ate, I think. That was one of my main problems, but at Le Mans, you just rise above any discomfort and forget everything else. That's because when you have the chance to win Le Mans, it's the chance of a lifetime. Looking back on it though, it must have been really tricky as I didn't eat anything for 24 hours apart from dysentery tablets. Then we won the race and oh my god, they suddenly stuck a champagne bottle in my mouth and it sent me a bit loopy. I was so tired I could hardly stand or think. I reckon I just collapsed afterwards and slept for about 12 hours. The film then jumps forward a few years to 1963 where we meet Ken Miles who is driving for Shelby's racing team at Willow Springs in California. Willow Springs is one of the oldest custom built road courses in the United States and is a perfect choice for the film to use given that Miles himself had a hand in designing its layout a decade earlier in 1952, shortly after moving to California from Britain. Before the race, Miles has a major disagreement with an official who threatens to disqualify him due to the fact that the boot of his AC Cobra won't shut. Something similar to this happened in the real life Southern California sports car race at Palm Springs in March 1955, where Miles built his own MG Special, nicknamed The Flying Shingle, and beat veteran driver Cy Vidor and Hollywood actor James Dean to victory. Miles was later disqualified due to the fenders on his car being deemed to be too wide by officials thereby promoting Vidor and Dean to first and second, much to Miles' chagrin. The moment though where Miles loses his temper and chucks a spanner at Shelby, accidentally damaging his car's windscreen in the process, is to my knowledge an invention by the scriptwriters. Miles owns a small tuning garage in California which is locked up by the IRS when Miles, short on money, fails to pay his bills. In real life, the closure of Miles' shop precipitated him joining Shelby American. In the film though, Miles is already driving for Shelby when he discovers that his business has been shut down once him and his son return home from race victory. Miles ends the scene resolving to retire from racing and take up a normal job to make ends meet, much to his son Peter's disappointment. 
Meanwhile, word gets out that Scuderia Ferrari is on the verge of bankruptcy. When Ford executive Lee Iacocca first shows up at Ferrari's HQ in Maranello to negotiate a buyout, he notices that a press photographer is there and tells his translator that if the purpose of their visit is leaked to the Italian press, then that's when shit hits the Fangio. Juan Manuel Fangio was of course the legendary 5 times Formula 1 world champion from Argentina, who had retired from racing a few years before in 1958. As feared, the deal goes south. In the film, Enzo Ferrari mentions some genuine grievances that his real-life counterpart had with the terms of the deal, in particular having to defer all decisions to do with racing to America, which he says undermines his integrity as a constructor. Enzo ends by insulting Ford's factories, its cars, and even has some choice words for Henry Ford II, aka the Deuce. Mr. Ford, Ferrari has a message for you, sir. What did he say? He said Ford makes ugly little cars in ugly factories. And, uh, he called you fat, sir. In real life, Enzo was just as upset but did not insult Ford so directly. He ended talks by simply getting up and announcing he was going out for lunch. Another consequence in the film is that when the press inevitably gets word of Ford's deal going awry, Fiat boss Gianni Agnelli is able to swoop in almost immediately and do a much more favourable deal with Ferrari instead. It actually took another six years for Fiat to buy 50% of Ferrari in 1969, and Fiat didn't become majority shareholders until Enzo Ferrari's death in 1988. In the movie, Ford believes that Ferrari never seriously entertained their offer and was holding out for a better deal from Fiat all along. Ford is made to look foolish, and this proves to be the inciting incident that spurs him on to enter the World Sports Car Championship and beat the Scuderia at their own game. We're gonna bury Ferrari at Le Mans. Ford's disastrous entry at Le Mans in 1964, which was handled by Shelby's former Aston Martin boss John Wire, is completely omitted from the film, somewhat understandably in order to keep the focus on Shelby and Miles. This also means that the film shows 1965 as Ford's first entry at Le Mans. There's a lot of designing, testing and trial runs behind every new innovation or new performance record. How do I know? My name's Carol Shelby and performance is my business. Shelby, who is at this point manufacturing and selling AC Cobras, meets Lee Iacocca for the first time in 1964 when the Ford executive asks him to develop and run their factory Le Mans Assault. In reality, Shelby already knew Iacocca after approaching him a few years earlier with the idea to build the Cobra with a Ford engine, and Shelby's existing relationship with the Blue Oval is even alluded to in the film when he assumes that Iacocca has come to collect his debts to the Ford Motor Company. This change is to make Shelby seem like more of an outsider to the corporate culture at Ford, as Iacocca effectively becomes Shelby's trusted eyes and ears in Ford's boardroom meetings for the rest of the film. Ken Miles and his son are subsequently invited by Shelby to the launch of the Ford Mustang, a car which Ken is particularly scathing of right to the face of Leo Beebe, Henry Ford's right-hand man and head of the racing department. Miles calls it a secretary's car. Mustangs, everything you could ask for on a secretary's salary. A comment which was in reality attributed to Shelby when he was asked by Beebe to develop and test a racing version of the Mustang which him and Miles subsequently did, despite his protestations. There is an irony that Miles had to extensively test a car, which in this scene, he is pretty adamant he would never drive. Here's something else that we're excited about. It's this new Ford GT. It was designed and built by Ford engineers as kind of a laboratory on wheels to test new ideas and prove Ford's capabilities in open competition. We've been given the job of testing this new car and racing internationally. Miles' first time at the wheel of the GT40 in the movie comes when Shelby whisks him away one evening to his HQ on a runway near LA International Airport, where the car has just arrived after being shipped over from England. Miles gets back home late, not having yet decided to be a part of the project, and his wife Molly becomes very upset when Ken is initially evasive about what he's been up to with Shelby, until Miles comes clean about his tests and reveals that he's being offered more than enough money for them all to live on. In reality, this test took place at Riverside International Raceway in December 64, and Miles' family was already on board with it. His son Peter was even present at this first test. In both real life and the film, Miles' initial impression of the GT40 after his first drive is... It's awful! 
This leads to a montage of testing and development, during which Ford hires aeronautic technicians to hook up a computer to the passenger seat in order to give them real-time data on the car's performance. Mars and Shelby decide to rip out the heavy data processor and try a more practical, old-fashioned approach, attaching pieces of string to the car to demonstrate an aerodynamic lift issue undiagnosed by the electronic sensors. This is also fairly accurate in portraying the different approaches of Shelby and Ford, who rumour has it invested $500 million into the car. 10 miles is not a Ford man. We're on the verge of something, and now you tell me that I can't have the best man in the world behind the wheel? One of the most interesting choices in the film is to have Leo Beebe pressure Shelby into putting American driver Bob Bondurant into his driver lineup for the 65-24 hours of Le Mans in place of Miles, meaning that we see the race from Miles' perspective as he toils away in the Shelby workshop, listening to proceedings via the radio. This is a good scene because it gets us into Miles' headspace, allowing us to empathise with him during the Act 2 low point of the narrative. It is, however, completely fabricated. In the real life Le Mans 1965 race, Shelby was able to field the car for Miles, teaming him up with Bruce McLaren, whilst Bob Bondurant, who was already part of Shelby's team and not forced upon him by Ford, competed in another GT40 entered by Rob Walker Racing. Seven hours into the race, all six GT40s retired with various mechanical issues. Miles' car retired with gearbox trouble, which in the film Miles correctly warned Shelby about beforehand. When Shelby returns from Ford's disastrous debut at Le Mans, he has to attend an awkward meeting with Henry Ford II. Shelby tells him that in all honesty he's not even sure if the paint on the car can last 24 hours, which is a real quote that was made by Beeb at the time. Shelby then points to the over-reliance on bureaucracy as putting them at a major disadvantage against Ferrari. This is something that Shelby's predecessor had actually pointed out before him. What does Ferrari have that we don't? asked Leo Beebe. I can tell you in a word, John Wyatt answered, Ferrari, one man who knows his mind instead of a committee. General Motors is run by the committee system, BB said, and they are fairly successful. Yes, Wyatt snapped, but how many races have they won? The Deuce decides to give Shelby carte blanche to do whatever it takes to get Ford to win Le Mans in 1966. To prevent BB from vetoing Miles from his driver lineup again, Shelby locks BB in his office and agrees to deal with Henry Ford that Miles can drive at Le Mans if he wins at Daytona. Needless to say, in reality, BB did not get locked in the office and no such deal needed to be made, as Miles had already proven himself by taking the GT40's first victory at Daytona the year before in 65. Danger becomes a prominent theme in the second half of the film. Ken Miles narrowly escapes from a fireball after a brake failure during testing for the Daytona 24 hours. While the real Miles had issues with his brake shattering, he definitely didn't have an accident anywhere near as colossal as the one shown in the film. Peter Miles then talks to Shelby's chief engineer Phil Remington, who assures him that his father was safe due to his fireproof suit. Peter then points out that British driver Stuart Lewis Evans died from burns after a high-speed crash at the 1958 Moroccan Grand Prix. His race suit wasn't much help. In order to circumvent brake failures, Remington designs a radical system by which the brake rotors can be quickly swapped out for fresh ones mid-race. The 1966 Daytona 24 hours sequence itself features a couple of alterations from real life. The famous Go Like Hell instruction, which was originally said by Bruce McLaren to teammate Chris Amon midway through that year's 24 Hours of Le Mans, is instead given at Daytona from Shelby to Miles via pitboard, instructing him to break the 7000 RPM limit Ford was enforcing for reliability purposes to try and win the race. It's honestly nice that they chose to include this as a reference, since McLaren and Amon themselves get no lines whatsoever in the film. Walt Hansgen is also introduced in this scene, driving a sister Ford for Holman Moody, a NASCAR team whom Ford had worked with for years before Shelby arrived. Hansgen is portrayed somewhat uncharitably as an aggressive and careless driver who pushes a rival out of the way in order to take the lead. Mars is able to beat him by breaking team orders, something which in the film he has to do as part of Shelby's agreement with the Deuce to get Miles into a seat at Le Mans. He pips Hanskin to victory on the run to the finish line on the final lap. In reality, Miles was already far ahead though, as Hanskin ended the race a lap down. What's a bit of a shame though, is that Walt Hanskin's fatal accident driving for Ford in the test day leading up to Le Mans in 1966 is omitted from the film entirely, especially given that the accident happened as Hanskin was trying to beat Miles' fastest lap time. 
there was a missed opportunity for the film to cover the effect that Hanskin's death had on Ford, Shelby and Miles going into the race, and it seems very odd to introduce him as a competitor to Miles, but not cover his tragic death given its timing just before Le Mans. Whilst the Team Mordis scenario depicted in the film did not take place at the real 1966 Daytona 24 hours, something similar did happen at the Sebring 12 hours the same year, when Miles was instructed by Shelby's pit board not to race leader Dan Gurney in the sister board, and despite initially giving Shelby the middle finger, Miles did eventually back off to the point that he was a lap down on Gurney when the American's engine blew up on the last lap of the race leading to Gurney being disqualified because he jumped out and pushed the car over the finish line, thus handing Miles victory. Leo Beebe was a little miffed by this, believing that Gurney's engine failure was due to pressure put upon him by Miles. Ken Miles, are you as surprised as we are? I'm slightly ashamed. Well, it was a big day for Ford, wasn't it? It was a good day for Ford. I'm very happy with the Ford Motor Company. I'm very sorry indeed for Dan. He really deserved to win the race. He drove a beautiful race, and I'm sorry that something happened to the last minute. How did Lloyd go for you? This is your third big long-distance win together, isn't it? I like our Lloyd. What's next for you? Lamar. The climactic, nearly hour-long sequence at Le Mans is where the film takes a few liberties with the events of the race. Miles lines up the number one car in second place on the grid behind Dan Gurney in the number three Ford, also run by Shelby, and they're both ahead of the third and final Shelby run Ford, the number two driven by McLaren and Amon. The number two's poor qualifying ends up being crucial later on. One of my favourite moments in the film is when Miles sprints into his car at the start of the race and accidentally bangs his head on the door as he gets in, meaning that the car door will no longer shut properly. Miles then has to never get a chaotic first lap with one hand holding the door in as he struggles to return to the pits, where the door is fixed by the mechanics forcefully bending it back into shape. Amazingly, all of this really happened, and it left Miles and teammate Denny Holm with a lot of work to do. During his fight back, Miles sets several new lap records and climbs back towards the front. Ludovico Scarfiotti is leading the race in the number 20 Ferrari, but he comes upon a pileup, loses control trying to avoid it, and crashes out. It then starts to rain, and Miles is running right behind Dan Gurney when the American's Ford blows a head gasket and his car expires dramatically. This all happened in the race, but understandably the film condenses these events together near the beginning. The film transitions to 8 hours into the race, and the number 21 Ferrari of Lorenzo Bandini is leading, following which he has an engrossing back and forth battle for the lead with Miles in the pouring rain. Miles begins to suffer with his brakes and can't get past, so decides to pit in order to swap out the damaged calipers. In the process, Miles loses a lap to Bandini, which means he has to pass him twice to take the lead as daylight begins to break through. Once he's finally caught up to and is side by side with Bandini for position, Miles pushes the limits of the Ford's reliability and the Ferrari conks out, leaving Miles with a huge lead. I don't speak Italian, but he ain't happy. There is a lot of dramatic license at play here. Bandini's car did last much longer than the other factory Ferrari 330P3s retiring 17 hours into the race, but Bandini's car never led the race and this lengthy battle with Miles is almost entirely made up. But given that we didn't really get to see Ferrari's domination at Le Mans in previous years, I felt like it was justified to have them in a much stronger position here than in real life, as the main opponent that Shelby and Miles had to overcome. It's also nice to see Bandini, winner of Le Mans in 1963, shown as a match for Miles on track, especially given that Bandini would lose his life in a tragic accident at the Monaco Grand Prix a year later. The film then covers what is perhaps the most controversial finish in the long history of Le Mans. With Miles leading, McLaren second, and the number 5 Holman Moody car of Ronnie Buckingham and Dick Hutchison in third, 12 laps down, Leo Beebe comes up with the idea of staging a dead heat with all three cars crossing the finish line simultaneously. Henry Ford the second agrees, and the order is sent down to Shelby who initially refuses until Beebe threatens to fire him if he does not relay the order to Miles. When Shelby tells Miles, he is surprisingly pretty calm about it. He resolves to break the lap record once more before complying with the request and slowing down to give Ford their PR friendly photo finish, believing that both cars can tie for victory. Is it possible to be equal in the championship? No. Shit. Can only be one winner. <laughs> when Miles and McLaren cross the finish line side by side at the end of the 24 hours, the officials hand victory to McLaren and Amon's number two car. 
on account of the fact that they started further back on the starting grid and therefore travelled a distance of 8 metres more than Miles' number one car. Keep in mind that the winner at Le Mans is measured in distance travel at the end of the race, not time. Mars is initially disappointed when he finds out, but handles the affair of relatively good grace, embracing Shelby and already focusing on coming back the following year to seal the deal. Miles also gets a tip of the hat from Enzo Ferrari, giving credit to his performance. So first off, in the film, BB's decision comes across as one deliberately intended to screw Miles out of the victory. In real life, I don't think this was the case at all. Ford had already lost 7 GT40s in the race due to mechanical issues and another to an accident. It's understandable with the three remaining Fords being so far ahead in the lead that BB would want to prevent his drivers from racing each other, which would have been very risky in that it could easily result in the drivers pushing too hard and either blowing their engines up or crashing into each other. It's also worth pointing out that the dead heat had never happened with Le Mans before, and when BB suggested the idea to Shelby they both agreed, believing that a joint victory would be awarded. And so did the race officials when initially asked about it. It was only after the command had been given to the drivers ahead of the final stint that officials came back to BB explaining why a tie would not be possible. When the technicality was explained to BB, his reaction was, Oh my god, that's not what we want at all. Is there any basis for appealing this? But of course, there was none. Most sources, including the film, categorically state that Miles was at least two minutes ahead of the number two car when the team orders were issued. However, Chris Amon, who shared the number two car in McLaren, recalled things rather differently when interviewed before his death in 2016. At that point, I remember we were leading, uh, Bruce and I were leading, and uh, Bruce was actually in the car, and the Miles' home car was running second, and the sign went out saying ease or you know back off as it were uh, or slow down a bit. The instructions with ease at the time was really to hold station. And Bruce slowed down several seconds a lap as did the other cars except for the Miles home car which um, maintained its pace and within a matter of several laps Ken Miles had actually caught and passed Bruce and that caused a, from memory a bit of consternation within the whole Ford set up everything became very confusing because the decision was made these guys won't do what they're told basically we're going to create a dead heat situation so there's no point in racing each other so according to Amon, the number two car was leading the number one and both cars were under instruction to ease off in order to make it to the end of the race McLaren obeyed instructions and kept to the slower lap times outlined by the team, but Miles, for whatever reason, either didn't see or flat out ignored the order and kept up the pace, overtaking McLaren against the instructions of the team. And this is what led to Ford calling off the race between the two cars and engineering the dead heat. This also explains how Miles was able to build up such a big lead despite losing so much time with the door issue earlier in the race. When Miles was told about the dead heat, he was agitated and upset, shouting at Shelby, so ends my contribution to this bloody motor race. Although Miles was a naturalized American citizen, meaning his victory would have been great PR for Ford as an American company, he hadn't exactly endeared himself to Ford as executives. Ford racing executive Jack Pacino once remarked, Miles would race his grandmother to the breakfast table, which was not intended as a compliment. There's also the case of Bruce McLaren to be considered. He was not just an accomplished driver and the youngest ever Grand Prix winner at the time, but also an engineer and constructor who had recently founded the McLaren Formula 1 team, which would go on to achieve legendary status in the years after McLaren's death in 1970. McLaren was also an incredibly well-liked figure by both the execs and the team, as he'd been working on the GT40 project since day one, long before Miles and Shelby. Ultimately, BB decided to do nothing and let things play out according to original orders. After the finish, there was initially some confusion as to who had actually won, but eventually the ruling was explained, and Miles swallowed his disappointment and congratulated McLaren by giving him a bear hug, something which he does not do in the film. Miles also never got a tip of the hat from Ferrari because Enzo infamously didn't travel to races outside of Italy, but it makes a lot of sense for him to be there in the film. It's a nice redeeming moment for Ferrari, and it's very in character for Enzo to acknowledge outstanding performances by non-Ferrari drivers. Miles was embittered by what had happened. He did not give many interviews, but did say this on the matter. I considered we had won, but we were placed second by a technicality. I just feel the responsibility for this rests with the decision by Ford over my protests to make the finish a dead heat. 
I told them I didn't think it would work. Miles then requested of his interviewer, Please be careful how you report what I have said. I work for these people, they have been awfully good to me. Ford intended to stage the dead heat to create a big story that would be in the front pages of every newspaper worldwide. And that's what they got, although not necessarily for the positive reasons they'd intended. Miles is testing the experimental J car for Ford at Riverside on August 17th, two months after Le Mans, and has just broken the unofficial lap record when suddenly the car veers uncontrollably off track. Peter and Shelby then witness a horrific explosion and plumes of black smoke cross the circuit. Ken Miles dies instantly, although the film sensitively chooses not to show the gruesome accident scene. It was the last lap of the day and he was pushing hard. Suddenly it went quiet and I saw a ball of fire. They kept me away, but I could see him. It's a bit traumatic seeing your father lying dead in the dirt. Whilst Peter was at the track to witness his father's death, Shelby was in reality at Ford's headquarters in Detroit during the crash, but flew back to Riverside immediately once news had reached him. After the accident, Shelby said, We really don't know what caused it. The car just disintegrated. We have nobody to take his place. Nobody. He was our baseline, our guiding point. He was the backbone of our program. There will never be another Ken Miles. In the film, Shelby struggles with grief, and when Dan Gurney takes over testing duty, Shelby is angry that Gurney is in Ken's car. Shelby also feels guilty that he unwittingly cheated Miles out of victory. Ken was so close to achieving the sports car triple crown of Daytona, Sebring, and Le Mans all in the same year, and will now never get the chance to fulfil it. This is something that the real Shelby confessed haunted him for the rest of his life. The cause of the accident itself is still a mystery to this day. In the final scene of the film, Shelby visits Miles' family, and whilst he can't bring himself to face Molly, he does get a few words with Peter, gifting him the spanner that Ken threw at him back at Willow Springs. Barely holding back tears, Shelby gets into his car, takes his heart pills, a reminder of his own mortality, before driving away. Whilst the incident at Willow Springs was fictionalised, the spanner's significance to Peter is actually very real. Peter Miles decided to follow in his father's footsteps, not so much as a driver, but instead becoming a race mechanic, plying his trade in off-road racing events like the Baja 500. The film ends with a few captions mentioning what happened afterwards to the key players. Ford would go on to win Le Mans four years in a row, whilst Ferrari have never taken overall victory since. Despite the doctor's grim prognosis, Carl Shelby actually lived to the age of 89, passing away in 2012. Both Miles and Shelby have been inducted into the prestigious Motorsports Hall of Fame of America. The film propels Miles from an unsung hero of the sport into the mainstream, and honestly I think that's a great thing. After all, there are already plenty of Hollywood biopics about previously well-known sporting figures. Since his death, Ken Miles has unfortunately become kind of a footnote in the history of the GT40, which is something that the film admirably seeks to change. However, this comes pretty much at the expense of Leo Beebe, who is almost cartoonishly vilified, and his characterization is the only major aspect of the film where I feel it misses the mark as an adaptation. The other changes for the most part I felt either streamlined the narrative or made it more appropriately dramatic. Whilst the racing fan in me would have loved to have seen more of Ferrari and more of the other drivers Miles was competing with and against, the film is already over two hours long, so I can understand why they didn't want to get bogged down in subplots by including too many supporting characters, as that would have made the film feel way too unfocused. Well, that about wraps it up for Le Mans 66. I could go on about other fascinating details that the film didn't have time to show, such as Miles' experience driving a tank through Normandy during D-Day, or Shelby's early abortive career as a chicken farmer, but if you want to know more, I would recommend AJ Bame's 2009 book, Go Like Hell, Ford, Ferrari and the Epic Battle for Speed and Glory at Le Mans, which is a handy source of information that goes into a bit more about the story. That's a winning combination. Dan Gurney and the new Ford GT. You're turning pretty good out there, Dan. How's it feel? Oh, I like it a lot. It feels like it's really going to go on a long straightaway. Like next year at Le Mans, maybe. It could really be a winner there. That uh, On that three and a half mile straightaway, I bet it'll be doing over 200 miles an hour. Of course, Le Mans 24 hours. How do you feel about it from the driver's standpoint? 
Well, that's a long race no matter what kind of a car you're in. But it actually has almost a passenger car environment in there. And uh... All right, you two. That's enough talking. Get out there with Ken and start putting some hours on those engines.